This is a Hot Pie Original. Any hardship we face, any struggle, any uncertainty, any, you know, thing that we have to endure um, during a row is mild in comparison to what that service member felt and even maybe more so what their families and loved ones feel um, with, with their loss. So um, we're going we're gonna to use them in spirit and try to, to dedicate a leg for 300 veterans. Team Shut Up and Row, comprised of James Hine, Brian Nicholson, Jonathan Burns, Brian Shantosh, and Chris Smith, is a team of veterans on a mission to row a boat 3,000 nautical miles across the Atlantic Ocean. Approximately 400 people have ever accomplished this feat, and they plan to do it in world record time. In this episode, we discuss why they'd risk their lives to make this journey across the Atlantic and how they're preparing for this monumental task. It's now time for the It's Freaking Awesome Story of the Week, brought to you by The Festive Kitchen. Every week we highlight stories of people who went above and beyond and thought about someone else before themselves. Now that is freaking awesome. This week we're featuring modern day Good Samaritan Jonathan Bauer. Though desperately afraid of heights, Bauer didn't even flinch when confronted with a decision to leap off a 40 foot bridge in order to save a little girl's life. While running errands, Bauer and his teenage daughter Ava were caught in a serious five-car pileup that sent eight people to the hospital and left a pickup truck dangling over the guardrail. In the water below, a young toddler was flipped on her stomach with her face down in the water. Bauer immediately peeled off his shoes and jumped over the guardrail, swiftly swimming to the toddler who appeared semi-conscious. He patted her on the back until she began to cough and expel the water from her system. Bauer pulled the two-year-old to safety into the hands of paramedics on the scene. He quietly slipped away, overwhelmed by the experience, but his community was determined to show their appreciation and commend him for his honorable actions, as do we. You are freaking awesome, Jonathan. Thank you for saving a life. Thank you for being a humble hero. But before we get to this interview, right now I just want to ask you something. Tell me if you know this story. You go out and spend several hundred dollars on a fancy wearable device, hoping that it would help you achieve your wellness goals, and then it ends up in your sock drawer. Sound familiar? Or how about this? You follow those cookie-cutter clickbait health recommendations like walking 10,000 steps a day, and all you get is anxious and demotivated when life gets in the way and you can't hit that magic number. Well, it's time for an evolution of expectations and results. That's where AIM-7 comes in. AIM-7 sets busy people free to live their values every day by building lifelong healthy habits. We use the health data from your Apple Watch to create small, scientific, personalized recommendations for whatever you want to do. Sleep better, increase your energy, reduce your stress, or lose weight. If you're ready to finally unlock the power of your Apple Watch data, then go to www.aim7.com. That's A-I-M-7.com to get early access to our exclusive program. AIM7 starts small and starts with you. Your health data, your values to get to your thriving life. Finally, if you're looking for information and resources to improve your health, well-being, and performance, then sign up for my free high-performance newsletter, Adaptation. Just go to www.ericcorum.com and sign up now. This newsletter is my effort to bring zero-cost, high-performance resources and tools to anyone with the desire to improve. But now, it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Guys, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for coming on the the show. I'm glad to, I'm super excited to talk to you guys about this crazy thing that y'all are about to do. So, you guys are about to compete in the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge about 18 months, which for the listeners, it's a 3,000 nautical mile row across the Atlantic. Less than 400 humans, I mean humans have ever accomplished this. It's easier to summit Mount Everest. So, why the heck are you doing this and who came up with this nutty idea? Uh, that would be oh. me. Okay. <laughs> I'm the one that originally started all of this. And where I heard about it, I was I was climbing Aconcagua. I was down there attempting to summit by myself solo. And Aconcagua is the highest mountain in uh, South America. It's one of the seven summits. Wow. So I was down there. I think I was at Camp 2. 
in my tent reading a book about uh, this guy sailing around the world by himself. And in his book, he, he was saying, why do people sail around the world? Why do people climb mountains? Why do people row oceans? And then just that one line, I was, I was hooked. I'm like, why do people row oceans? What is that? <laughs> So when I got back from Argentina back to Colorado, I started researching rowing oceans. And then I came across the Talisca Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. And I was just like, this is, this is one of the coolest things I've ever heard about. I have to do this one day. I started researching it and I found out that it's really expensive. The boat, the logistics, the airfare, you name it, it, it costs a lot of money. So I kind of stopped thinking about it because of that. And then uh, I met James a few years later and I still wasn't totally into the, into the row yet because of the money, but I said, Hey James, let's do this, this, um, this thousand mile canoe race up North in, in Alaska and Canada. Mm -hmm. So we we're going to do that. We were in, and then thanks to COVID it shut down that the canoe race. But in the interim talking about and planning about the canoe race, I brought up to James the ocean rowing, just, just casual conversation about over, over coffee, just talking about life and adventures. And, and I can tell I saw that little spark in Jim's eye. He was interested, mm -hmm. but we never really took it to the next step because we were doing the canoe race. But then, uh, like I said, with COVID and then, so our canoe race got pushed a year because of the COVID and with our working schedules and whatnot, we weren't able to do it. But Jim says, hey, what about that ocean row that you brought up? <laughs> and if it wasn't for Jim saying that, we wouldn't be having this podcast right now. So hold on a second. How many years ago was this that you're summiting this crazy mountain in South America? It was in, that was 2012. It was 2012. November. Is November of 2012, yeah. So it took you nine years or eight years to get your act together on this thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, if if you if you start thinking, I mean, I don't I don't well, I don't want to speak for you, but is the fear of this thing was that was that kind of a a reason it was kind of slow rolled? No, I'm 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 not afraid of this race at all. It's there's okay. I've never have any fear or I'm not scared about, about any of that. It, I think it was financially mm. and having other commitments. I have children and, mm. and work. And so I think my family commitments and primarily money. Yeah. Cause the, the boat, boat itself is what? 150 grand, James. Uh, we're looking at over 127, I think right now, just to get it outfitted. We've still got more we have to put on. So, and for the people listening, this isn't like a boat that's got like, I can't like, this is open row, open ocean rowing. This is like you exposed to the elements with two oars in your hands and no like shelter from what could happen on the ocean. Am I correct? You are correct. That's freaking awesome. When you're on the oars, there's no shelter, but there there is a uh, a, a bow and stern mm -hmm. compartment. Oh, really? At, when you're not on the oars, two guys will be in there sleeping and sleeping. Personal hygiene, eating, mm -hmm. navigation, maintenance of the boat, uh, and then if if the if the seas are really big enough the storm kicks in then the other two guys that would have been on the oars at the time will climb into the other compartment mm -hmm. so there is some type of shelter to to get out of the elements i got gotcha. you so you three of the four well we really have five people right now there's four people that are going to be competing in this competition are all military vets how how if you're Jan Jonathan, were you also are you also a vet? No. Yeah. So no, I'm the only one. Right. That's okay. Uh, but how has like that kind of prepared you? I mean, you've all done some pretty gnarly stuff for something like this because the 
the mental resilience that's going to be required to go. And by the way, you guys don't just want to row across the ocean. You guys want to break the freaking world record, which is 29 and a half days. And that requires optimal conditions. If the seas are really, if the ocean's really bad, you could be out there for 40 plus days rowing two hours on, two hours off. Like, how has your former careers, do you think, prepared you for some ch- for a challenge like this? I, th- I don't want to speak for everyone, but my, f- my former career being in the military, I think, yes, of course, it, 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 it will help me. Mm-hmm. But very little, I think. I think what's going to help the team is, is that human spirit that's in each and, uh, and every one of us. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I, I really, I'm not going to lean back on, on my former career at all. Hmm. It, would it help me? Yes, I think it will. But I think it's the human spirit that's in each myself and all my teammates that is going to, is going to do it. I mean, you've done some pretty hard things, right? Yeah. At times it was, it was <laughs> tough. <laughs> I mean, any great athlete, I mean, you guys are all athletes. You know what I'm saying? Like to do this, you can't be just some couch potato. Like you're all athletes. You build on previous successes. Like you're not going to go summit Everest if you haven't climbed a 10,000 foot. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you do things that are hard and you accomplish those things and you can look back. Pardon me. You can build on those successes. Like I've done this hard thing. Now I'm going to challenge myself some more. And I've done that and I've acquired this set of skills. You see what I'm saying? Like, do you think any of that's going to transfer? Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty neat. Like <clears throat> it is, um, you just keep building, you know, you don't know where your margins and your capabilities end. And so you try something new, a little bit harder, try something new, a little bit harder. Maybe, maybe life throws stuff at you and you're forced to endure something harder and harder. And so we're going to, we're going to definitely have to resource all of those experiences that we've had in our life. And I think we've all built up a pretty robust collection of those experiences. Um, one thing though that I've noticed and I'm I'm really interested and keen on is um I've been on four person teams, ultra endurance races, you know, adventure races and stuff. And I had the hardest time when it was an all military team. And um that was interesting. And I started finding much greater success when the teams were blended, military and civilians. And I found myself as the only military guy on a on a four person adventure race. And having the greatest success. Why is that? You think? And then, yeah, and, and it's interesting because it's not just um, not just my experiences, but it's been been uh, recounted many times from all military teams working. You got four, you got four aggressive alpha males, um, all from a little bit different here or there. Rank structure starts to interfere with with things, and there's just a lot of those dynamics. And so, while our military experiences are going to bring a lot of benefits or advantages to us. Um, there's also a couple, uh, a couple pitfalls that we want to try to avoid. And so that's why we're spending a lot of time getting to know each other. You know, we've, none of us have ever served with each other Mm -hmm. in a, in a service capacity yet. We all have the experience of service, um, different branches of service or different agencies or commodities inside of our services. But, um, so we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time really getting to know each other, trying to get that special brotherhood, that affinity for each other and to, to read each other and know each other who, who's at their worst under what conditions and who does, who's at their best under what conditions. So that's what I'm really excited to explore when we start getting time under, under tension together uh, and then drawing that out over, over lengths of time, you know? So what does time under tension look like? I mean, we talk, like, cause I know that we've got some 24 hour rows planned up are those the type of events where like you're getting tired you're out there for a while because you have to apply a certain amount of pressure and stress in order for those things to start bubbling up because when we're all sitting here well caffeinated and hydrated and in our comfy homes things are great but when pressure comes what your habits come to the surface so how are you how are you guys planning on trying to pull those things out so you can deal with them now yeah we are planning uh, a 24 hour row and I think that's just going to be the start of it. We would like to push it up to a 72 hour row because I can't speak for everyone, but Tosh, you brought this up recently. Uh, You, 
I don't think the human body's really going to start to feel the pressure or the time under tension as, as Tosh likes to call it, uh, until well after 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yes, we do have some, some long rows planned and I think, well, I don't think, I think we're, I know we're going to get some things together, probably in the mountains uh, along this or along that, or, uh, possibly even another, we, Tosh and Chris and myself, we, we brought down, I think, seven trees in 24 hours all by hand with hand tools in the, in the middle of a Colorado winter. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And if we can get another one of those this coming winter, <clears throat> we will. So it's really up to our imagination and our time, what we can cook up and, and uh, bring out that human spirit when we're tired. I like that. Uh, I think there's something I want to piggyback off of what Tosh said. There's a, um, as, as that pressure starts to form, there's this, this enjoying the suffering with the people that you're around. Like there's a big camaraderie with this that really starts to happen when you're miserable of all places. It's, you know, it's all fine and anyone is fun, but when you get along with people, you're absolutely miserable. It does make for something really magical. <laughs> yeah. I think our buddy Clint Bruce says, learn how to suffer well. <laughs> he uh he said good teams suffer well together uh when i met him oh shoot i think it's 11 years ago now he came and spoke he's the he's how i found out about this so if y'all you know i think everybody knows clint but clint's a a seal and just big burly dude you know got this big beard former football player at naval academy and he came and spoke at florida state when I was coaching there and he talked about the suffering thing. Well, we, we became really good friends and I don't know, was it three, six months ago or three, four months ago, he calls me up. He's like, Eric, I have this thing for you. He's like, I think it's perfect. He goes, there's these four crazy nuts that want to <laughs> row across the ocean. I'm like, I love crazy stuff, you know? And so anyways, I think that's a great point. I don't think I've ever been around any team or unit that didn't have a very strong training camp where things got really, really tough and it was hot and it was hard. And then you saw some, there was some tipping points typically in there somewhere where things got rough. And then that's how those teams kind of grew together. So, uh, Jonathan, you excited about cutting down some trees and carrying them out of the Colorado winter? Yeah, absolutely. What I'm, uh, I'm definitely a process guy. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the process of, uh, of training for these sort of things or just training in general. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, just like the guy said, I think it's critical that we get some time together and we figure out how to, how to work together and figure out where, where we're going to break down and how we can kind of uh, help each other along. John, what's your background as far? I know you, you're, you're one of the guys that from a physical capacity standpoint for this is like top tier. What's your background as far as all this stuff? Like, how did you get into these types of endurance types of races? Well, actually, I've uh, never really been like a like an ultra endurance guy. Mm -hmm. I have a background in rowing. So I was a collegiate rower. And then I rowed with the U.S. national team uh, post-collegiately and had some success there. I've been doing some indoor rowing in my old age here and managed, uh, managed like a national championship a couple of years ago and stuff like that. But most of the races I've been doing have been seven minutes or less. Mm. So this is going to be <laughs> multiples of, of a, seven minutes, <laughs> a little bit of a departure from, from what I'm used to. Uh, and it, honestly, I'm, I'm really curious to see how, uh, my body will react to it. Um, and in my mind, I think it's a, I had a buddy I was chatting about this opportunity with, and he said, man, this is a really great opportunity to figure out a little bit about yourself very quickly, you know, and, uh, and, and learn about yourself. So I think getting out there and, and just the training process will be excellent. So what's the, I mean, you, you've been on, like rivers and flat water with, you know, groups. Now you're in an open ocean environment where things are like, what's the big difference between like getting on your concept to rower or on a flat uh, river or whatever versus being out in the ocean? Like how the differences in training for this? You know, it's, I think being on a, 
obviously like rowing a boat on flat water, we want flat water when we're rowing in shells. Like that's what you go for. The, the ocean's not going to be flat. Uh, we can almost guarantee that. Um, the biggest thing, you know, chatting with these guys is like uh, technique and, and moving the boat is a force multiplier. And I know that force multipliers are something that everyone kind of understands pretty quickly. So, you know, we talk about training, we talk about getting, uh, you know, our Watts up and, and having, I think, uh, Brian wrote Watts, Watts equals, equals knots the other day on our, on our group text, which was pretty clever. But, uh, the, I think the biggest thing is just understanding that like how we move the boat and our technique on the water is going to be a force multiplier for us. So mm. once we, once we can get out there and, and really practice on the water, I think it's going to be critical. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick second to thank one of our awesome sponsors. Let's talk about the snack that's freaking addicting. It's freaking awesome. Well, it is freaking awesome, but that's actually the name of the snack. It's freaking awesome. It's freaking awesome is a nosh snack bag, a sweet, salty, crunchy snack with a kick. This snack has corrupted the palates of NCAA athletes to 87-year-old grandmothers. So if you have a road trip coming up or there's someone you want to tell they're freaking awesome, then order now online at itsfreakingawesome.com. It tastes as cool as it sounds. Brace yourselves. You'll be ordering frequently for your monthly freaking fix. The good news is now they have a freaking monthly subscription. It's freaking awesome is dedicated to snacking it forward. Each pouch features one of our fallen heroes and 30 cents from every unit sold is donated to carry the load. A charity founded by Clint Bruce, benefiting those who have given the ultimate sacrifice in our military, firefighters, police, and rescue personnel. Available online at itsfreakingawesome.com. That's I-T-S-F-R-E-A-K-I-N, awesome.com. The row coach, you know, he and I were chatting and he was like, you know, Eric, what his name is Gus Barton. He's like, you could be at like a 30 degree pitch, you know, and then the boat is tilted at an angle for hours at a time. He's like, if the ocean's really jacked up, he's like, you see what I'm saying? You could be going mm-hmm. doing this and be like this angled at the side rowing. And he goes, he's seen guys' bodies just blow up. And so what's interesting, because if you're used to this, this like very linear process of forward and back, forward and back, same motion. Now you're this, this at all these angles. He's like, you have to develop a very robust body to handle the mm-hmm. rigors of all of this stuff. And so this isn't just like, like I said, getting on your concept two rower and going for, for 30 days. This is like riding a roller coaster and rowing for 30 or plus days, hopefully less than 29 and a half. How are you preparing your body for that? I don't know if you can, you know, I, I mean, I think you have to have like, that's one of the major concerns I think we all have is like, it's not, you know, the, the scary, what would we say? The scary thing is like getting eaten by sharks, right? <laughs> like that's what everyone thinks. That's what everyone's minds go to. But I honestly, I don't think that that's the, that's going to be the issue. The issue is those is just the body breaking down and, and, you know, like, like Tosh was saying, like sun exposure, chafing, like all these little things that you don't think about. I think that's going to be the critical, the critical aspect. So how do you problem solve this? Like, what are you guys doing to think through all these scenarios? I mean, when you're planning for something like this, do you put up on a board? Like what are all the things that we think could occur? And then you strategize in advance to like come up with for tactics for how to deal with these. And then also knowing that when you get out there, something's there's going to be stuff that happened. You're like, crap, we never thought about that. And then you just got to adapt. But like, what are the crazy things besides getting eaten by sharks? By the way, is that a real thing? Like a shark could jump out and eat all y'all? <laughs> Actually, I think last year that was, um, was it swordfish or built some sort of billfish that had a, that two boats got penetrated and um, just missed like, I mean, like eight inches through the hull and they had to do boat repairs because uh, these, these billfish were chasing schools of bait fish and uh, penetrated a boat and it happened on, didn't it happen to two boats, like within a 24 hour period. Yeah. Um, two boats. Both two uh, I mean, freak, right? Like freak, uh, freak stuff that happens. And 
I think one of the biggest training mindsets that I've always had is, um, yeah, you try to reasonably anticipate unknown unknowables, right? Like combat, you don't know, ever know what the enemy's going to do an independent will trying to, to beat you. And you, you try to reasonably anticipate their different playbooks and prepare for those. But a lot of times you have to build up this, um, response mechanism to just be okay, no matter what gets thrown at you. And you just, submit yourself to whatever. Anytime somebody says, Hey, you want to go do this? I, I don't ask any questions. I just say yes and go and, and just experience things. And inevitably it's by saying yes to any and every endeavor that you expose yourself to something that you're going to be able to draw upon when an unknown or an unknowable or an unforeseeable, you know, leaps into your, into your lap. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, training for, for all this other stuff. I, it's like easy. Everybody says, Oh, how much rowing are you doing? I'm like, well, well, we've got a row coach and we've got to be doing some rowing, but this, this event's not really about rowing. Um, it's being able to row, row well is, is like, like John says, a force multiplier and there's, but there's a lot of force multipliers. And if you're going to chase a world record, you have to recognize as many of those force multipliers that you can and identify which ones you have control over optimizing, you know, and for, so for training, like chopping down trees, well, what does chopping down trees have to do with rowing across the ocean? Well, I don't know. It was cold, tired, you know, all these different angles of movement that, that is not that, that linear direction, mm -hmm. um, being on the side of a mountain, I think body sparring and wrestling and any, anything and everything that you can do, climb a mountain, you know, swim, anything that you can do to just kind of make your body a little bit more robust and do it while you're tired, do it while you're grumpy while you're sore, you're drunk, whatever, um, it's going to help you build, build this to be able to, uh, entertain whatever mother nature decides to deliver. I love it. So how are you going to eat on this thing? Like you, you, you take off from the, the Canary Islands, right? Canary Islands to Antigua, good places to start and end at, by the way. Um, and like, you got to pack your food, right? There's no like there's no like refueling station along the way. Am I correct? Like everything you start with, you end with. Am I correct on that? Or am I missing something? You're correct. Any outside support will be disqualified. Okay. So what's the, like, what are the crazy, like, like how are you planning food? Do you start a little fat and happy knowing that you're going to lose weight over the next month? Yeah, we, we can, we're definitely going to try to put some pounds on if possible. Uh, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, I don't even know if that's physically possible with the training that's going to lead up to this race. I'm not going to be able to do that, but so I'm just going to, I'm just expecting to lose a lot of weight. Oh, we can make it happen, dude. We can get enough calorically dense food in you. The question is, is could your ego handle a belly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be all right. Okay. No, I'm being serious though. I mean, this is like kind of a war of attrition to some extent, like soft tissues break down. You, you like, you can't pack so much food that you're in a surplus. Like you kind of want to lose, like if you have a little bit extra body fat, you can know, okay, we're going to be burning X amount of kilocalories a day. If we go under a little bit of that, that's food that we're not having to row with on the boat that conserves energy, but also we can, we're going to lose a little bit of weight. Do you see what I'm saying? We're going to think a lot of weight. Their rowing coaches, uh, we basically went through and interviewed a bunch of people. One of them said the average weight loss was around 16, 70 kilos, which is 35 pounds. So that's losing 35 pounds per person on, on a row over the course of an entire row. Um, to your question is, is what are we, what are we packing? How are we managing food? Uh, we're going to use a combination of two things right now, looking like, uh, some dehydrated meals and, and that's honestly for probably a, a little bit of uh, happiness at the end of the day, getting a warm meal in your belly. The other one that we, that we've worked with, um, resilient nutrition, Ollie McDonald, mm -hmm. Ollie McDonald, they have these really cool nut butters, um, super calorically dense, high fat. Uh, they, they backfill with some micronutrients, et cetera, to prevent you from heading into any sort of deficiency over the long, over the long haul. But that's kind of a, that in a nutshell. We don't want to get scurvy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. <get scurvy. laughs> and Ollie's a sharp dude. That guy is wicked smart. Um, you got some really, really smart people supporting y'all. Good, good, good teammates on this thing. 
Is there a fear that you have at all? I mean, Brian, you've already said you're fearless. Like we can throw you out of a plane without a shoot and you're good. Uh, but seriously, are there any fears that you guys have about this at all? Anything in, in mentally you've addressed to yourself or thought through when you're laying down at night going, huh, I'm really going to do this thing. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think my biggest one is um, letting these guys down. Hmm. You know, we're all, we're all investing two years of our lives to try to prioritize this however best we can with our regular lives and all the other commitments that we have and obligations. And uh, we've all just made a pact that, uh, Hey, we're going to prioritize this the best possible in order to achieve the results that we envision we want to achieve. And, um, that's the biggest thing that keeps me up or keeps me thinking or questioning what I'm doing and the choices I make day in and day out is I don't, I don't want to show up on that boat. I don't want it to be day 14 and Tosh breaks. And these other, these other three, three gentlemen that are on a boat with me are like, wow, Hey, thanks a lot for wasting two years of my life. And so that's what keeps me up most of the time at night thinking about not letting these guys down. Hmm. Yeah. I wholeheartedly like echo that same thought. Like another one that kind of gets me is I'm completely blown, blown away by the amount of support that uh, everyone has offered up. And that's from, you know, families and family and friends. Um, that's through the, the people that have come on board as sponsors so far. Like I have a genuine fear of letting those individuals down. Like that, that actually truly matters to me as well, as well as my teammates. Um, outside of that, uh, like, I think, we, I think it would suck to be eaten. I just <laughs> don't want to follow up or be not it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, who knows what type of birds are out there or crazy crap going on. I mean, it's just kind of the deal, you know, like I've done a lot of backpacking and you, you, you come up on some crazy stuff when you're out in mother nature, stuff that you just wouldn't imagine have happened. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's some wild stuff out in the open ocean. What do you think the worst part of a long duration open ocean row would be? Like, if you just think of, think through it, like the good thing is you're together. It's not complete isolation. But like, what are like the, th like for a 40 day row, let's make it for us, let's 29 days, right? 29 day row. What would be the worst possible thing about this? Butt chafing. Butt chafing. <laughs> That's legit, man. Salt sores on, on our butt. Yeah. How do you protect against that? Is there like special butt chafing, like paste? <laughs> <clears throat> No clue. Working through some of the uh, coconut oil mixtures, everything else they put in like the uh, little deodorant sticks. Yeah, trying to train it all because I think that would just, on a day to day basis, destroy like my inner inner sanctum. Yeah, you know, like you can't get comfortable, like you can't row, you can't put out, you can't support your team. I just think that would be terrible to go down for butt chafing. Yeah, that's a legit deal. Have you guys been following the uh, the Iron Cowboy right now? He's on day like 95, 96 and a uh, hundred triathlons in a hundred days. And he's going to do this thing. The first time he didn't make it. And uh, I'm trying to get him on the podcast. That dude is tough. I mean, freaking Jeez. warrior tough. And he got ridiculous shin splints early on. And I'm like, for sure. I was my biggest concern is his, his fracture is his uh, tibia. You know what I'm saying? From all the repeated trauma. But I mean, it's been like walking, like he's just doing whatever it takes to get done. And that's what I think about when one of these events happens, like biceps tendonitis that happens on day 10 and you just got to figure it out, you know? And he mm -hmm. just, he kept talking about, I've been, I've been really because you, when you when somebody's doing something like this, you get a unique peek into their soul. And he's talking about suffering and just the pain of like you just got to, you know, running at the end of the day, 20, whatever, whatever marathon is, 20 something miles at the end of the day, every day for 100 days. And he's in so much pain. And it's just like the mind isn't built for this. But for him, it's he had a couple buddies that are with him. That somebody was doing the bike with them. Somebody was swimming with them. Somebody was walking and running with them. And it's just, I see that with y'all too on something like this. It's like, I su I, I'm i suffering. You're suffering with me. And it just makes it, you can actually look at somebody. You know what I'm saying? Misery loves company. Yeah. It's truth though, right? Like 
Yeah. My football days, and granted, it's nothing like this. Like when two days sucked the most, you're sitting in the locker room and everybody's just looking at each other and you're like, all right, let's do this. You know what I'm saying? Like it's going to be 100 degrees outside. It's hot as hell. Let's get after it. I think we're all going to rely on each other hmm. at some point. We're, from the moment we start to the moment we finish, we're all going to be relying on each other. Hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm sure at times I'm going to be at the lowest of lows and I'm really going to have to rely on my three teammates. And uh, so I'm, I'm counting on everybody to, to boost me back up. And, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be the same at another time for someone else on the boat. And that's why the team dynamics has to be so, so strong in order for, to complete this race and not just complete it, but you know, the outcome that we're searching for. Yeah. How do you, you know, we talk about process versus outcome, you know, what is the process for you going to be like, you know, we, you want to break a world record. You want to be one of the first um, group of Americans that ever podium in this event. I mean, there's a lot of firsts that can happen, right? Right. Um, how do you, stay consistent with the process and not think about this desired outcome. I really enjoy being on a team. I really enjoy being uh, part of a group, part of a training group. It gives a, gives like a focus to the day or to the week, that sort of stuff. That the process of training for something is uh, I think there's an enjoyment in that. Um, I think you get that. I think all the guys that, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're on teams in the military or on teams with, you know, the high level teams, sports teams. I think the people that, that do that sort of thing, enjoy the process. So, um, you know, the biggest challenge for us is that we're all in our forties and we all have lives and families and everything alongside it, you know? And so we have to balance all that. For, for me, it's the, uh, that day-to-day -day training. Like I, I love logging on and seeing like, Hey, this is what I'm doing today. It gives me that direction, that purpose, that, that focus that I don't, the outcome is super far away, but that immediate process, the, the day-to-day -day focus is there. Like I'm somebody who I just loves that day-to-day, -day, uh, drive when I know what it is. I know which direction it's, it's putting me in. Mm. If I can do that, I'm a happy camper. What about your family's spouses, loved ones? What are they saying to you right now? <laughs> uh, yeah, so my wife's uh, supportive, I suppose. Right? <laughs> uh, no, you, for, speaking for me, you know, yes, yeah, so the biggest fear is the biggest fear is uh, not coming back to my family, of mm -hmm. course, right? Like, I want to make sure that uh, this is something I wouldn't have signed up for it if I didn't think we had a very, very, very high probability of finishing it and 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 uh, and actually doing what we're setting out to do. Um, but yeah, the family is. I think they're kind of wrapping their head around it. I don't think it's going to get real for them until everyone leaves. Mm -hmm. You know. Brian, this was your brainchild. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I came off that mountain in 2012, one of the first people I went to was my wife and mm -hmm. started talking about this. And uh, so this is nothing new to her. And, and then, then fast forward, when when James says, hey, what a, maybe we should put this Dallas whiskey back on the table. Perf the first person I went to was my wife. And I asked her, hey... I want to talk about this race again and I'm not going to, I'm not going to Roger up for it unless I have your 110% backing mm -hmm. because I, I cannot get out on the water knowing that you're only in it 50%. So I'm going to tell James that I'm not into it. I don't want to do it unless I have your 110% backing mm -hmm. and I got it and I still have it. And I know I will still have it on day one of the race. And uh, so yeah, as long as I have that backing from her, it's it's easy. It's easy to keep pushing and driving. That's the real team, man. To be honest, I mean, like yeah. when you have a tight relationship like that, it allows you to do things like that. You know what I'm saying? Because 
we all been in committed relationships in different ways in our lives. And when we do something that goes against the grain and those people that we love the most aren't behind us, like that's hard because it's yeah, not the day to day. Go ahead. It makes training hard. It makes everything hard. Mm -hmm. And as long as if, if I don't have that, that external pressure of, Oh, my wife's not really into it. If I don't have that, well then everything else I can apply more you know, effective pressure to the training's better. The everything's better. It's easier. It's, it's, and I can reach my full capacity because I know I have that back. Mm. Now, this isn't just about rowing 3,000 miles and breaking a world record. There's like some real reasons behind this too, like some real deep reasons that you guys have articulated. You want to talk about those, the two big ones? Well, so like one of, one of the things we signed up for, um, they we're passionate about the oceans and that, Something all of us travel quite frequently, and wherever we go, we always see these. This is the same thing. Like, there's the world's oceans, just roads out here outside of my house. Everywhere has a ton of these little white plastic bags, clear plastic bottles, etc. It's it's kind of disheartening to go anywhere in the world now, and you see the same trash piled, sometimes piled up. Um, consisting of the exact same thing, which is single use plastics. Mm. So we linked up with Five Gyros and uh, really wanted to promote um, an awareness of the, the environmental impact that these single use plastics have on us, our oceans, our environment, etc. That's that's one of the things that we really wanted to get out in front of, find that cause that resonated with all of us and. As soon as we heard, or we, you know, we kind of discussed different avenues, but as soon as we heard that one, we we're like, hey, this is this, this is something we can all get behind. Mm. That's, that's one of them that we really jumped on board with. What about the second one? Well, we're doing, um, I'll jump in on this one, fellas. Uh, we're going to, we're going to row, row to remember. Mm. And so we sort of dubbed this um, 3,000 miles for 300. What we're going to do is we're going to dedicate a 300 divided by however many miles we're supposed to row. So it's about 10 miles per, per veteran that gave their life um, in service, mm. right? So we're going to go chronologically uh, across battles, campaigns, fights, conflicts from post-Vietnam through combat era or today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to remember, we're going to dedicate a section to, uh, to a veteran uh, along the way help uh help the world just try to say their name again um help the families know that they're still loved and still remembered and a common theme is is service right so mm -hmm. back to where james is talking service to the world with the oceans and a and a real significant problem there and and these these veterans their service for whatever whatever it was at the time they gave their life for that so any any hardship we face, any struggle, any uncertainty, any, you know, thing that we have to endure um, during a row is mild in comparison to what that service member felt and even maybe more so what their families and loved ones feel um, with, with their loss. So um, we're going to we're going to use them in spirit and try to to dedicate a leg for 300 veterans. I, I, I love I love the reasons why you're doing this, you know, cause reasons, I think the, the, uh, the person with the most conviction and the most, the best reason usually wins, you know, when all things are equal, like it's, it's like what's in here and are the people behind you. And, and I think that you guys have the right why, you know what I'm saying? And, and, um, uh, I'm, th I'm also just want to say I'm thankful to be a part of this to help support y'all because you guys are some special dudes. And uh, uh, I think it's 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 going to be very exciting. And <clears throat> I'm interested. We have some great people that have already partnered with this crew. Team Shut Up and Row, which I love the name, by the way. It's freaking awesome. Um, there's some been some great organizations that have come alongside. We got Rogue, you know, and some others. But how can if somebody's listening to this and they're like, you know what, I I really get this and I want to support these guys. Um, how can, how can they support? Where can they find y'all? Uh, on Instagram team, shut up and row. Okay. And, and then we are, we're rounding the corner, having our website up, I think next week or two right now. Okay. Um, as soon as we get that, we'll get it to you. So you can stick up the show notes. 
we'll definitely make sure that people can find a way to give money because uh, that's really important. This thing doesn't happen like unless we have financial support to get it done. And uh, when people do support, they can, you know, there's going to be the website, there's going to be uh, boat logo placement. Uh, and and I, I have a vision for this thing, man. Like when you guys are halfway across, three quarters of the way across, it's going to become a huge news story. And when that happens, then we're going to be able to bring, shed a light on why you're doing this. And I think it's also a great opportunity for sponsors to be a part of something that's very, very special. And how often do you get to be a part of a group that's actually going to do something that's like, they're really punching above their weight. You know what I'm saying? To like be the first American crew to podium. And then let's chase after that big audacious goal, of breaking a freaking world record. Um, you know, that that's yeah. going to be pretty gnarly. Another way that people can really support is, you know, we're, we're kind of just scrambling to build this campaign on our own, you know, mm -hmm. um, anybody with talents in, in marketing or promotion or fundraising or administrative stuff, or, mm -hmm. you know, that's, we're, we're trying to invite talented people that are motivated, that are willing to invest time, energy, and, and, mm -hmm. and fidelity into this endeavor as part of the bigger team. It's so while there's four, four individuals in a shell in the middle of nowhere, really we want to create this team of hundreds of people that are part of the larger team so that they can share the success. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. Hey, these four guys just did this. It's this broad group of people from all over the place that gave effort mm -hmm. and um, are contributing to the success. And there's a lot of shortfalls that we have and, you know, just, the administrative side of the house, logistics side of the house, you know, um, just a ton of stuff that we're just looking for people that want to want to provide their expertise, but also have energy and are, are willing to put in some effort for it, you know? So, um, that's so another great way that people can support. Reach out on Instagram, raise your hand if you want to get involved and we'll find a spot for you. If you got some talent and some desire to help, does that sound about right? That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm putting that out there. Um, I'm going to definitely, once this thing goes out, we're going to be putting on in some cool places to, to find some of those folks. Now, this is a podcast about high performance. So, uh, I ask every guest, and this is the first time I've done a group, a group of folks. So I want each one of you to, in your own words, what does high performance mean to you? Man, I need to think about that for a couple of seconds. <laughs> you think it should come off the tip of your tongue like really, really quick, but um, it's a, you it's, might have to edit out some some quiet time here. No, it's very interesting. Whenever I ask this question, people really start to reflect, and the answers are very interesting uh, because it is a it's a it's a it's a deep phrase. I mean, high performance. Like, what does that mean? If anyone want to take a stab at it, one of the things that jumps to mind is. Uh, <laughs> Op uh, operating as optimal as possible for as long as possible and giving your given domain, uh, whether it be an Olympic weightlifter who has that momentary, I mean, massive amount of power to the ultra endurance runner who has to become as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. They both have to become as efficient um, in their domains. I, I think high performance, regardless of domain, means you're op operating as efficiently and optimally as possible. Yeah. That's great. Jonathan? Yeah, I think it's uh comes down to potential, individual potential and team potential, and how you know how much of that potential can you eke out when you're when you're competing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh there's a lot of folks that have extremely high potential, but they never reach that potential. Uh, they just can't perform well, or they just, uh, for whatever reason, they they haven't been able to, 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 to get to a point to where they can really express their potential. So, you know, high performance to me means understanding your body and understanding your team and, and getting the most out of that, you know, and when it's uh, a good, a good individual or a good team that you end up with with uh podiums and world records love it go ahead Josh. i will save the team captain for last so that he can he can put the, the finishing touches on it um <laughs> i just think uh you know that that phrase doing the uncommon uncommonly well mm. um to me that's 
that just kind of sums it up nice and neat. You know, our our mutual friend Clint um, Clint Bruce, right? He uh, he made a comment. We we've hung it on our um our tickler or whatever, but it's like make no what's the what's the phrase? What's the quote? It's like about setting goals here. I'm screwing it up. Like, go ahead, Brian. I'm going to, I'm going to find it here in a second. No, make, make no small plans for the lack of magic to stir men's souls. Yes. Right. Like, Hey, let's, let's set something big. Let's just set big, big, huge, crazy goals. Hey, it sounds, it sounds absurd. You know, Hey, here's four guys that have never been in an ocean rowboat. They don't row. Um, they're meatheads. Uh, and they think that they're going to set a world record. Like they're, people would say you're just absurd. You're it's stupid. And then, but when, when we sit down, I started thinking about it. It's like, yeah, that's what high performance is, is setting something so lofty and then dissecting it and, and then just chasing it. And, and along the way, you know, so uh, doing the uncommon, uncommonly well is set, set magnificent goals and then just, just keep chugging. <clears throat> it's beautiful. I think high performance is uh, in, in this particular case, in this, we'll, we'll, what we're planning for has nothing to do with one person. Mm -hmm. It's our team. It's, it's the four of us that are going to gel and that's how we're going to succeed. Yeah. We're all, we're going to train hard physically, mentally, and we're going to come to the table ready to go, but it's, it's going to be our team spirit that is going to drive us up and pull that, that inner spirit out of, out of every single one of us. And then we're just going to, we're just going to crush it. Mm. So when I think high performance, I think four people. It's not, oh, high performance, Brian. What is high performance to you? It's you really have to, it's high performance and it's four people. Mm. And that's how we're going to succeed. So each person is going to bring out the strength of his teammate. And we're going to form this one tight bond. And that's how we're going to do well. I love it. Well, I am personally thankful to be a part of this in a small way. And to help support y'all, if you're listening to this and this doesn't get you jacked up, you need to listen to a different podcast. Um, but uh, we're going to make sure that you guys can can support these gentlemen and, and what they're doing. And I'm looking forward to having y'all back. And it's going to probably, let's, let's say January, February of 2023, because this is December of 2022 when this thing goes down, because I think that there's going to be a lot of growth and character development out of this and some, some, in, some amazing things that are, you know, from a personal standpoint, that y'all be able to reflect on, but thank you so much for joining today. And, uh, I'm excited to, to see what's going to happen over the next 18 months as you guys come together to tackle this big, hairy, audacious goal. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate being here. If today's podcast enriched your life in any way, please support The Blueprint by doing one of the following. If you're listening on an audio platform like Apple or Spotify, please subscribe. If you're listening on Apple, please leave us a five-star review and some feedback. Your feedback is tremendously valuable. Finally, if you watch this on YouTube, please subscribe and also leave us some feedback there because we'd love to know how we can improve the show and which topics you're enjoying. Thanks for joining me, and I look forward to engaging with you across all of our platforms. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home on the web at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.